um, our last presenter for this session and for the symposium itself is Jesse Wolf. He's a master's student at Trent University. He's presenting on his and Aaron Schaefer's work on new tools that are going to provide novel insights into mountain goat ecology and evolution. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Jesse. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Hopefully everybody can see uh, my presentation there. Sure can. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So I just want to thank everybody for sticking around. Um, and before I start, I also want to respectfully acknowledge that a large portion of my research took place on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga Anishinaabeg, and also acknowledge that my study area for part of this presentation is located on the unceded territories of the Gitson, Lake Babin Nation, and Wet'suwet'en peoples. We offer our gratitude to the First Nations for their care for and teachings about our earthen relations. May we honor those teachings. I also want to thank my funders quickly. So NSERC, the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance, Forest Enhancement Society of British Columbia, the British Columbia Mountain Goat Society, Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, as well as my colleagues at the BC Ministry of Forest, Lands and Natural Resource Operations, as well as at the Wildlife and Applied Genomics Lab at Trent University in Ontario. So with that, I'll get started on my talk. From pelts to genomes, new tools provide novel insights into mountain goat ecology and evolution. So ultimately, to assess mountain goat ecology and evolution, there are some kind of old ways of doing things that have taught us a lot, but there are also new methods and technologies that provide us with exciting areas of research, specifically using non-invasive pellet samples, which is a kind of overarching theme of the research that I talk about today. So speaking about some of the old tools, <laughs> excuse me, overall, we've learned a lot. So specifically using microsatellites and targeted gene sequencing, we can learn about population dynamics, as well as evolutionary relationships. So a specific note, we have a pedigree at Caw Ridge that has shed light on mating tactics and female reproductive strategies. As well, we're able to uh, place mountain goats in a phylogenetic tree of related species using some of these old tools. And another thing the, these tools are useful for is using them in conjunction with these non-invasive samples. So as I mentioned before, some of these older tools that we use are microsatellites. So micro, microsatellites are still very useful for delineating, understanding population boundaries, and specifically when we use these non-invasive samples. So our, our lab at Trent completed two recent studies that combined both pellet and hunter harvest samples in Southeast Alaska on the left and Northern BC on the right. So both of these use genetic data and structure analyses uh, with large implications for management decisions. However, that being said, microsatellites do still have limitations. So notably, many state and federal labs use different markers than we do, for example. So we can't necessarily compare those markers. And even if we use the same markers, they require calibration. So this really, this really limits the integration of studies and data sets across groups. Additionally, resolution isn't always the best. So for example, some of the paternities at Caw Ridge still have um, some uncertainty. And additionally, we cannot assess adaptive divergence or um, interactions with other genomes and the idea of the hol hollow biome. And with respect to this talk, I'll be talking about the gut microbiome. And this is essentially, the hollow biome is essentially considering this idea that uh, we're representing the combined genome of the host, the individual, as well as all associated microorganisms. So we're thinking about the individual and the gut microbiome in this case as a single unit. So with some of these new tools come new opportunities. So since roughly 2010, we've seen uh, advancements in sequencing technology, which have allowed us to sequence and assess the entire genome of mountain goats. So one of my colleagues, Daria Marchenko, uh, generated a reference genome and in doing so helped identify some unique genes in mountain goats with some of those genes being linked to hemoglobin and oxygen affinity and also she helped identify some unique genes in mountain goats and assess how the environment's actually able to shape genetic divergence in mountain goats. But as I mentioned a handful of times, uh, I'm really gonna be focusing on non-invasive samples. So using these, non non, these new tools, sorry, we can make use of non-invasive pellet samples. So we can sequence the gut microbiome from these pellets. And what we can see here on the right uh, from work done by my colleague at Trent as well as Sarah Haworth, is that using these non-invasive samples and the gut microbiome, we can delineate populations, we can clearly separate captive and wild groups, and also identify sick animals. And I'm gonna come back to this a bit later as it is a focal area uh, of my specific research for my masters. 
But ultimately, with these new tools, we have less limitations. So with genome-wide SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, we don't require any calibration. We also have hundreds of thousands of markers relative to you know, a couple dozen microsatellites, thus providing us in, uh, incredible resolution. We can also generate information, as you've seen on a couple of the previous slides, on adaptive divergence and assess key components of the holobiome, in this case, the gut microbiome. And while gut microbiome is relatively new in wild systems, one of the benefits is that we can use these non-invasive pellet samples to assess an important aspect of species biology. And in the rest of this talk, I'm actually going to be focusing on a specific study that I conducted as part of my master's thesis on uh, ungulate gut microbiomes. So this brings me to the second chapter of my master's thesis. And this research was largely exploratory. So I asked the question, uh, what else can we learn from pellet samples to inform ecology and management understandings alongside GPS data? So I approached this question using this GPS data to generate home ranges and space use patterns and the gut microbiome to ultimately provide a proof of concept to link non-invasive pellet samples to home ranges. So I know I've touched on it a little bit, but just briefly, the gut microbiome is this system of billions and trillions of bacteria in your gut that have a wide variety of impacts and roles on behavior. So some examples, some example studies uh, have shown that the gut microbiome can influence disease progression and autoimmune disorders. It's been linked to certain ratios with increased BMI, obesity in humans. It's shown to have a, an impact on memory as well as diet choice. But uh, in my research, at least ultimately, I aim to evaluate the relationship between the gut microbiome and movement and space use. So as I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, this is a very exploratory part of my thesis. So we have these pellet samples and how can, how can we tie them into management at different levels? So what else could we really learn from these non-invasive samples? So to answer this question, we looked at the specialist mountain goat in Northern British Columbia and the generalist white-tailed deer just outside of Ottawa. Ontario to integrate high throughput sequencing and GPS tracking to evaluate the relationship between the gut microbiome and space use. And just briefly, when I say generalist, I'm talking about a species that can thrive in a wide variety of environmental conditions relative to a specialist that thrives in a more narrow range of environmental conditions and typically has a limited diet as well. So what we did was we quantified the relationship between key microbiome diversity metrics on home range size and proportional habitat use of multiple classes. And then just quickly again, when I'm talking about home range, it's the area in which an animal lives and moves on a periodic basis. Whereas when I'm talking about that proportional use, it's the relative use of a given habitat type compared to a total amount of use, or in this case, a total amount of GPS points. So when we're thinking of movement and space use, it's a highly complex system of behaviors. So we have to consider things like age, immature individuals move differently relative to mature individuals. Sex has an impact, so males move differently relative to females seasons able to impact movement and their habitat use strategy, specifically, you know, generalists move differently relative to specialists that impact space use as well. But more formally, the way I assess space use was used generating home ranges using Brownian bridge movement models. So in that figure on the left, you can see 50% core ranges in red and 95% home ranges in green. And then moving to look at the data with respect to the gut microbiome, the way we can access this is by sequencing the 16S rRNA gene. So really the nice thing and the utility about this gene is that every microorganism has one. So we can use universal primers and generate a wide variety of data. So it's just one example there on the bottom right, that's a hierarchical structuring dendrogram. So essentially it just assesses taxonomic relationships uh, between individuals based on their gut microbiome composition, which is, is kind of interesting. I think. But the, the two metrics that I'm going to focus on heavily um, are this firmicutes to bacteroides ratio, which are two phylum of bacteria that make up a large portion of the human or large portion of the gut microbiome and a high ratio. So a lot of F and not a lot of B is consistent with obesity and increased BMI. And the second metric I'll look at is Pelu's evenness. So this is uh, more of a typical evenness value that expresses how evenly individuals in the community, in this case, the gut, are distributed over the different species. So a value of one being perfectly even and zero being perfectly uneven. So looking at some of the key results, we found that the gut microbiome uh, correlates to core range size in both a specialist and a generalist ungulate. So I'm just going to unpack this figure a little bit. But what we can see on the, uh, the first panel at the top there, the x-axis is that F to B ratio. So again, a high ratio is consistent with increased BMI. 
the y-axis is core range size. And what we can see here is that regardless of species, generalist or specialist, an increase in F to B ratio is linked to an increase in core range size. Where conversely, when we look at the relationship between evenness on the X and core range size on the Y, there's a difference of directionality when we look at a specialist versus generalist species. So an increase in evenness in mountain goats is linked to an increase in core range size, but reverse in white-tailed deer, where a more even gut is tied to a smaller range, core range size. Uh, but regardless of uh, species, it's, a, it's, it's clear here, at least preliminarily, that increased F to B ratios may help individuals accumulate fat stores to survive the winter and ultimately may be tied to individual condition. With respect to uh, the habitat portion, or sorry, the proportional habitat use, we looked at three distinct classes per species, and we only noted clear relationships um, in the mountain, in mountain goat uh, data. So the three variables we looked at here were escape terrain, so that's that steep greater than 40 degrees in slope uh, area, tree habitat, which is used in winter when uh, individuals move down in altitude, and heat load index, which is essentially a combination of radiation, aspect, and slope. And it tells you it's kind of a proxy for how much heat an area gets. So our main conclusion with respect to um, proportional habitat use was that the gut microbiome weakly correlates to proportional habitat use in a specialist ungulate. So I'm sure you all know, but using or sorry, uh, using escape terrain and lower alpine tree areas are defining habitat characteristics of mountain goats. And we noted a negative relationship between evenness and proportional habitat use of both classes. So an increase in evenness uh, corresponded to a decrease in the use of escape terrain and tree uh, areas. So what does this all really mean? In terms of and sorry, in terms of some main conclusions, increased gut diversity might promote individuals moving through and foraging in larger areas. Um, and as such, sorry, and as such, the ability to utilize and forage in a more diverse array of habitat types might allow certain individuals to access and subsist in areas that other conspecifics are not, which uh, other conspecifics cannot. So that increases their competitive ability, which is a really important finding, I think. And then ultimately, using pellet samples and GPS data, we were able to provide a proof of concept linking the gut microbiome to important behaviors and traits. And hypothetically, moving forward with a big enough and validated database, we can take a pellet sample from the landscape and say something about the space and habitat use of a species. So with that, I just want to thank you all for yeah, sticking around, taking the time, and I'm happy to take questions. And I also just have some references here of our recent papers that came out of our group at Trent University, if anybody's looking for some reading moving forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jesse. We actually do have a couple questions that have come in. So the first sure. one here is from Katherine. Uh, she says, really cool talk. How do you think gastrointestinal parasites could affect a, I'm going to assume this is a goat's uh, or other host's microbiome? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure on how the actual sequencing of that gene might change if we're looking at parasites. Um, it's possible that it would have a role, but that being said, there is this a lot, there's a, there's a handful of research questions surrounding, but the stability of the gut microbiome. So there is this idea that even though there's, you know, temporal changes in diet leads to short-term shifts, there is this kind of idea that the core set of bacteria um, in the gut is conserved because it's necessary for digestion and stuff like that. So there is this kind of debate between stability um, or dynamic kind of shifts, but it, I think it could have an effect, but that might be maybe something that, you know, if for some reason the parasites are alleviated, there might be a shift at the time and then that's kind of uh, back to normal kind of moving forward, if that makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have another one here. So are the microbiome ratios thought to be the cause or a consequence of differences in fat accumulation, BMI, et cetera? Yeah, so that's a, a really good question. It's something I kind of maybe not necessarily struggled with, but kind of that directionality is something that's uh, a bit more uh, contentious. So it's thought that the, the specific roles of the different bacteria actually allow individuals to, you know, a little bit... Um, maybe not formally, but add mass or increase metabolism. So it's thought that these bacteria are necessary not only for digestion and stuff like that, but a higher ratio of a certain one is going to, for example, a higher ratio of the firmicutes, the F, is going to allow individuals to actually uh, store more energy, whereas an increase in bacteroides is going to allow individuals to have an increased metabolism, for example. So I'm not exactly sure if it goes 
100% succinctly one way or the other, there probably is this interplay or uh, middle ground, if that makes sense. Um, but it's it's a really good question and something we definitely, you know, had discussions about. So thank you for that. Thanks for the answer. Another one just came in. So did you account for the fact that more related individuals or individuals that move together might have more similar microbiomes? That's a really good question. We ha I hadn't thought of that. And that's actually um, something I'm hoping to get some reviewer comments back soon, hopefully. Um, so that might be something that I, that I bring up or at least look at reanalyzing. I'm not exactly sure. So with respect to our study area, um, there are three mountain ranges that aren't, uh, aren't separated by huge distances, but we're not, we haven't seen actually movement between the mountain ranges. So that might be something to control for at least like a, not like a quasi population level um, control that individuals on a certain mountain range might be slightly more related. Um, but that also does tie into that idea of like, how stable is the gut microbiome? Is it something that it might shift very finely between populations? But uh, I don't think we saw any significant differences between these values between uh, when I compared populations, but something to double check for sure. So thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so people can continue to submit questions. Um, seeing as that you're the last one of the day and once we close off, there might not be the opportunity to answer questions in the same way. Um, I'm wondering um, whether the organizing committee can send those to you or if people should just direct them to you. for whatever keep my, my okay oh yeah yeah totally fine i, I got i'm good on email my twitter was on the uh on page two, so whatever okay, works. sounds good so so everybody knows uh just if we end up closing out then uh feel free to send the emails and we'll make sure the organizing committee can connect to anyone that come through later but thank you so much for that jesse we really appreciate it cheers and with that we've concluded our presentations for the day so i just want to really thank everybody for for participating and for sending in some really great questions and for all of the presenters. And with that, I'm going to bring our session on behavior and ecology to a close. And I'm going to pass it off to Beth McCallum, who's going to wrap up and close out our time together. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Beth. OK, thank you, Jenna. Um, yeah, this has been a fantastic symposium. Um, I want to really first thank Rob Harris and Jenna Curtis for all of their help and making this run really smoothly. It's been actually uh, something brand new for all of us. And I think we've really pulled this off really well, but not without a whole lot of help. I want to thank all the moderators um, and speakers or moderators, Margot Pibus, Susan Coots, Kevin Hurley, Mike Yokenum, Jocelyn Poisson, Mark Boyce, Marco Festibianca, Jenna Curtis. Uh, thanks for running these sessions and, and helping all the speakers get ready uh, beforehand and, and making it all work. Um, and thanks to all the speakers. That was amazing, um, uh, an amazing assemblage of uh, presentations. I'd like to thank Ann Hobbs for the disease plenary um, and all the speakers. This was an excellent session for those who are not uh, specialists in disease and a really good way just to keep up informed without what's in the literature and what new, new, um, new things are happening in terms of dealing with disease and, and uh, in the future. That was great. Kevin Hurley ran an efficient business meeting. Thanks, Kevin. And I'm really glad that you're staying on as our executive director. Um, it, it really helps uh, our, our council just keep continuity. The Wild and Wool um, um, film was really excellent. It was amazing. I think it's uh, going to be an important tool for education in the future um, of dealing with uh, problems with domestic um, and the proximity of domestic animals and, and uh, wild sheep and goats. Um, our social was fun. Okay, we would have preferred it to be in person, um, absolutely. But I got to thank Doug McWhorter, uh, Kirby Smith, and Wayne Heimer for for all the for the music. It was, it was great. Um, Kevin Hurley even um, dug up sheep and goats. Uh, Parks Canada uh, film from uh, a few years ago. We watched that, and um, yeah, it was fun uh, just to chat. Um, and everybody in tiles, of course, but uh, I think uh, when we get to Wyoming, the bar is set high for the next social and hopefully that's in person. Um, Wednesday, 
and Thursday today, a full suite of really excellent high quality talks. Um, we explored all facets of sheep and goats behavior, habitat, ecology, management. We learned about new tools available and new insight into old uh, issues. It was really great. Um, my first symposium actually was in 1998. I presented the paper as a student, but I think you keep coming back to this group because of, um, well, a lot of reasons, but uh, what, it's a pretty unique place for people that are working with uh, bighorn sheep and goats in North America to get together and share information and knowledge, discuss, debate, and it doesn't really matter where you're from. You can be from academia, government, industry, consultants, First Nations, non-government organizations. This is just a place where you can get together and learn and uh, communicate. We all do our best when we collaborate and this kind of um, um, venue gives us a really good opportunity to set up collaborations and keep up to date with what's going on. Um, Kevin, our council actually, our e-news network, Kevin was um, um, encouraging us earlier to sign up. Uh, and if you haven't, it keeps us informed and uh, of new events. Thanks Kevin for, for maintaining that for us all over these years. Um, once again, I wanna thank my committee big time. Uh, this was a lot of work um, and I'm not gonna let you go away that quick. <laughs> I think we'll plan to meet after for a debrief, probably a week Friday, and I'll be in contact with uh, an email. But thanks again, everybody for all the hard work. It was wonderful. Um, our attendees, it was great. Uh, the attendance, uh, the questions, um, really make the effort worthwhile. I think at one point I noticed there were 400 and, no, 243 uh, um, attendees. That's, a, that's a really something we would not have achieved if we were in person. Um, and that was one, one aspect of um, the Zoom. It actually made it more available to, to people that wouldn't have been able to get the approval or even to do the travel to, to uh, to Alberta. Um, we'll be publishing a proceedings, Catherine Rookstall, uh, with the help of Ann Hubs, will be uh, putting that on for us. And most presentations will be available on the Northern Wild Sheep and Goat Council YouTube channel. And there'll be likely more information on, um, on how to access that uh, forthcoming. Um, Okay, our next symposium. Oh, I really wanna thank our sponsors one more time um, for staying with us. And um, it's really appreciated. Uh, um, and thank you one more time uh, for supporting our, our council. Our next symposium is in 2022 in Wyoming. I hope it is in, in person, but uh, we did discuss a hybrid symposium um, which may have its benefits as well. Uh, but I guess uh, in closing, I'd like to say, I hope to see you in Wyoming. Uh, stay safe, everyone. And thanks again for a great symposium. Um, Beth, if I can jump in, you yep. just want to take a minute and say thank you to the Alberta Committee. You know, every two years, somebody has to step up, a group of people stepped up, and this one had its hiccups and had its challenges more so than typical. And I think we all had trepidation about a virtual Zoom based type thing, but I think we set the bar really high on it. Again, Rob and Jenna, thank you guys. You made this not seamless, but damn near seamless. And so we couldn't have done it without you, but um, we've all learned a lot. I think we're all gained a little bit of comfort that these are possible for a far flung audience. And so uh, huge thanks to everybody that participated. I counted up approximately 40 presentations and uh, uh, really want to thank the Alberta Organizing Committee and um, kind of like when they adjourned the Olympics. It's like, you know, in, in four years, we invite the youth of the world to, re to gather and it's like, well, them plus all us, all us old goats and, and the young kids and lambs. So we'll see you in Wyoming in about a year and a half, we hope. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. All right. All right.